The following is an Eyewitness News special presentation. His two terms in office as mayor in the 1970s helped shape much of what we know as modern New Orleans. But Moonlander's legacy of service dates back decades before that. And it continues with many of his nine children following him into public service. Now, as Moon Landrew turns 90 years old, he's looking back in a one-on-one -on -one interview with Eyewitness News political analyst and Gambit columnist Clancy Dubose. Moon at 90, Landrew looks back. First of all, Mr. Mayor, thank you for doing this. Happy to be here. And we're sitting on your front porch, which has been the center of the Landrew family life in many ways for the last 60 plus years. I think it's also one of the first places I ever interviewed you, and it's the first place I interviewed your daughter, Mary. So this is the perfect place to have this interview. But I want, you, I want to take you back 50 years. When you walked out of that door and stepped on this porch to take your children and your wife down to St. Louis Cathedral and then to City Hall to become the new mayor of New Orleans, what were your thoughts as you stepped on this porch 50 years ago? I'm not sure I can, I can recapture every one of them, but I can tell you it was one of great satisfaction and satisfaction and pride. But I know it was also nervous and with anxiety that we were beginning, not ending a campaign, but beginning the administration of a, of a city that needed help. So I was very excited about it, and we were treated so beautifully by everybody. It was a very beautiful day, much like this, as yes, I recall. It was. Uh, Moon, you are remembered for many things as mayor. One of the most off sided milestones was integrating the top tier of city government with your political appointments. You appointed the first black department head, Pete Sanchez, the first black CAO, Terrence DuVernay, and many other African-American appointees to top positions. Why was that so important to you personally? Well, I had lived through the, uh, an early childhood where we were basically, slavery was ended, of course, but we were still in a period in the 30s of, uh, of blacks being horribly treated. And it wasn't just a question of racial justice, but from a practical standpoint, I recognized as a politician, as a, as a legislator and a councilman, that we were wasting so much talent and wasting so much energy by precluding the blacks from participation in all matters, government and business and all the important matters of the economics of the city. And I was determined as I became mayor uh, to revitalize this city and to bring about racial integration so that the mayor could, the city could enjoy a full benefit of the white and the black uh, participants. That's, that's really what was driving me on the racial issue. Uh, I mean, we're coming out of a long history of slavery and, and Jim Crow and racial segregation and mandated by law into an era in which we were trying to integrate and make the city functional. Uh, and I think to a great extent we achieved some of that. Well, you endured some pretty withering criticism for your advocacy of integration and civil rights even before you became mayor. What did you tell yourself to get through that? And, was there someone to whom you turned for advice or even solace during those, those years? Yes, of course you have to seek advice. And uh, one of the people I spoke to often was Norman Francis, who was then dean of, of uh, Xavier University and uh, who had attended law school at the same time I was there. And uh, I remember meeting Norman. I was a freshman, I just finished my freshman year and Norman came in. He was the first black admitted to Loyola University. And uh, I liked him from the moment I met him. And I saw for the first time a, uh, a, a black who was smarter than I was, better looking and better mannered than I was. It was a, a real opening for me to understand more about this racial issue than I did as a kid coming up. So I consulted Norman quite often about these racial matters. Sometimes I just had to ignore what they said and move on with what I, what I had to do. 
and I hope that most of it was right, but nobody's perfect, and I'm sure the errors I've made. Every mayor who serves eight years sees major events. I'd like to take you through some of those events and just get your comments about where the city was at that time and how the city responded and how, how you responded then or even now. Uh, the Ralts Center fire in November of 1972 was one of those first things that really brought that kind of tragedy into people's homes because TV cameras were able to show it live and it, it, it was a real shocking moment for the entire city and a tragic oh, it was moment. A it was a terrible period because you actually saw one or two people, I forget which, jump out of windows at this, on this building. And it was, a, uh, it was a real calamity. And it brought home the, the dangers of high-rise buildings and uh, the ability of the city to protect against these 50-story buildings. Now, that was not a 50-story building. But uh, we did well having that we had before. How do you protect these? I believe I, that fire actually led to a state law requiring sprinklers yeah. in high rises. It was an eye opener for all of us. Then, uh, just a few months later, in January of 1973, the Howard Johnson sniper incident, also captured on live television. That uh, that probably was one of the most significant events of my administration. Because I was in office and the city hall is right across the uh, Duncan Plaza, so to speak, from the Howard Johnson. And when this thing started, we didn't know what it was. It, it was a fire to start with. So when the fire trucks came and these men ran up the ladders to try to get to the hotel floors that were on fire, they ended up getting shot. I left City Hall and went over to uh, Howard Johnson, and I was in the basement of Johnson, and uh, saw one of the firemen who was shot uh, in the hotel. And uh, ultimately, they were, the, the, the police department forced the people to get on the top of the roof and then a helicopter from borrowed from the army or not borrowed but used from the, the National army helicopter Guard, I guess, yeah. came with one of our officers aboard and shot uh, uh, the perpetrator on the roof of the hotel one last item that just be the last one that's sort of tragic uh, the upstairs lounge fire in June of 73 uh, was it a Again, one of those things uh, that uh, the news media covered. I actually covered that. That was the first big story that I covered as really? a summer intern. <clears throat> I went to the scene of the fire and then to Charity Hospital and wrote a story about it. Um, you know, 32 people effectively murdered. It was one of the first mass murders of gay people uh, and the largest one until very recently. And uh, it, it was a shock to a lot of people. and. Uh, but it came at a time before the gay community had really been publicly recognized as a community. Uh, talk about what you were doing as a feeling as mayor of the city and, and dealing with the archbishop and other religious leaders and community leaders in response to that. Well, I had, I had, I had a couple of gay friends uh, at that time in my life. Prior to that time, I hadn't had any gay friends. And I was away in Europe on a trip. Uh, wasn't a, it wasn't a vacation. I was there for a purpose. And uh, I got word that this happened. And it's one of the regrets I have. I, I, I should have found a way to come home immediately. But in my mind, at the time, the event was over with. By the time I got home, there would have been nothing there. But it's, uh, it's one of my regrets that I have during the term of office I served. The 1970s also saw the birth of New Orleans actively and consciously pursuing tourism as a major economic cornerstone. Talk about that and what role City Hall played in that. Well, there was a, uh, a study made that uh, suggested that uh, the city should concentrate on manufacturing and other trade and so forth that existed in other cities. But I remember 
reading that study and giving it serious thought, but it occurred to me that, that did, we had tried in New Orleans, but because of our topography, because of the water problems and the flood problems, uh, we just didn't fit at the top of the scale for entrepreneurs for that purpose. But uh, there were people like Lester Kabakoff and others I could name uh, who were into building hotels because they saw this city as a giant uh, in terms of, of tourism. And so we embarked upon an effort to increase uh, our tourist attractions. And uh, so we built a number of hotels. Now we had to be careful about the quarter because you didn't want to overburden the quarter with hotels, but the quarter certainly needed uplifting. The quarter was virtually dead. I don't mean dead, that's a bad statement, but it, uh, it was just flat. And the, and the French market was, was a disaster. And the reason it was is that it had lost its vitality because with the coming of supermarkets and deep freezers, people could go to the markets, buy all they needed, put it in their deep freezers, did not have to go to the French market every day to buy their, <laughs> the, the staples they needed. And so we determined to straighten that out, and we did. Y'all rebuilt the French market. We really built ways. the French market, and, uh, and we constructed some new buildings and a very grim we created some parking opportunities by consolidating the railroad tracks that were ran along the river. And we consolidated those tracks and tore down a couple of old buildings that had no significant historic interest other than the fact that of the age. But we needed to move forward. And uh, I, think, I think it made a great difference in the, in the quarter. And of course, it made a huge difference in the attracting of tourists. Up next, what the former mayor says first attracted him to politics and how he thinks it's changed since he entered the ring. And later, what advice he gave his children when they followed him into political life. I've heard it told, and I won't reveal my source, but it's one of your daughters, <laughs> that Verna had been active in Loyola student politics and that she kind of maybe was a spark that lit a little bit of a flame. Well, that is very true. I, was, uh, I went to Loyola on a baseball scholarship <clears throat> and uh, went into business school. And I ended up meeting Verna by virtue of a double date that a former baseball colleague of mine had taken Verna on and I had another date and I got to liking her and I asked him could I date her he said sure so I ended up dating Verna and she was serving on the uh, the student council as a representative of her area and uh, I used to go to the student council meetings I didn't go for the meetings. I went there at a certain time to, when it ended to pick her up and take her home and go on a date. So it was from that inspiration of her. She's, she's always been a great woman leader. And uh, I got inspired to run, and I successfully won and served on the council, and from that was the beginning of my political career. <laughs> How is politics different today from when you were coming up? Well, there are, there are many, many, many differences, but the, from a visual and an effective standpoint, it's the media. Uh, when I was coming up, you only had the papers, and it was in the newspapers that you got your news or you had radio. And of course, it required political organization to get to win. But then television came in, now, today it's changing the game, and there's the social media, and I can't comment because I'm not into that and don't exactly know how it works. But it's, uh, and as you say, and you know this, nothing stays the same. And uh, 
How it's going to change uh, in the future, I can't say. But it's uh, it's it, it's made us. This new communication, social media, is making a big difference. Moon at 90, Landrew looks back. Now you were appointed HUD secretary by President Jimmy Carter during the final year or so of his term. What did you find rewarding and challenging about that job? Well, I often look back and ask myself, did I make a mistake? Because I left a very fine position uh, to do it. Uh, but I really thought that I could do something. We had it that I could do something for cities across America. I was deeply involved in, in the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I was president. I knew what cities needed, what they could do. And I thought I could bring some of that thought to uh, to the national government, and I did. I didn't do any miraculous things because operating at the level, it's like operating a huge steamship in the in the in the ocean. You can only change it a little bit at a time. Uh, but I think we made a difference, and. Uh, uh, I, I fully expected President Carter to get it reelected, but he didn't. So it was a very short period of time, and I'm honored to have served. I sometimes wish I had passed it, but I didn't. There was a time when some friends of yours promoted the idea of you running for president. I'm not sure my friends promoted it. I think I promoted it. Okay. <laughs> and I remember you had a conversation with your mother about that before. Well, and after. I was. Uh, I had served in the cabinet, and uh, and the president had lost. Uh, so in four years, there was going to be a new president. And having been president of the U.S. Conference of Mass and served in the cabinet, I thought there might have been an opportunity uh, for someone like myself to run the next in the next four years. So I gave it some thought. And as the election approached, I attended a couple of functions for candidates. Uh, it was not a widely held functions. And uh, I then realized that there was, it, I couldn't make it. There was no avenue for me to get elected. Uh, I was from Louisiana. A uh, black candidate was running. Uh, and uh, there was no pathway for me. So I decided uh, not to run. And uh, I advised the people around me that there was no staff or anything. We had not gotten to that point. So I thought I'd better go tell my mother before it became public. <laughs> she lived in our apartment with us here, uh, lived in an apartment in the house. So I sat her down. I said, Mom, I something I want to tell you. I said, I. I've given a lot of thought, and and I've decided not to run for president. But before I make an announcement, I'd already concluded I wasn't doing it, and make a public announcement. I'd, I'd like to get your feelings on it. <laughs> and this was typical of my mother. She looked at me and she said, well, how do you think I feel when those other men are running for president and my son is not? <laughs> All I could do was laugh and hug and kiss her because <laughs> she thought that well of a son, you understand, that I ought to be president. <laughs> I think I had a mother like that too. <laughs> she was wonderful. <laughs> did you encourage any of your children to go into public office or public life, or did it just happen? No, I've, uh, I, I have not forced anyone and not pushed anybody. Uh, but they couldn't help but want to uh, be in what they saw, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer. Your child sees what you do, and some of them take a liking to it and some don't. Uh, a couple of my kids took, didn't take a liking to it, but there were others like Mary and Mitchell took automatic, automatic attraction to them. Uh, several of the other kids, you couldn't have begged them to run, and they wouldn't have run. 
What advice did you, did you give to Mary and Mitch and Madeline when they told you they were going to run for office? I'm not sure that I had a specific bit of advice, but I know that I had to tell them that it's difficult. Running is difficult. Uh, and you have to be able to withstand the trauma of a loss. If you don't think you can take a loss, don't do it. Uh, but run to win. And if you don't win this time, then there's another chance ahead of you. What are you most proud of during your eight years as mayor? My wife and my nine children. And I think that's a very simple answer. I think when I look back at it and my life generally, it's how lucky I was to find Verna and how blessed we were to have nine good kids and to revel in their uh, birth of 37 grandkids and, and they have various careers in, in law and politics and in, in other areas. So uh, I'm a very grateful man. I'm grateful to the people who serve with me, Larry Coleman, Richie Kernion, uh, Helen Lorio, Mary Zervigon, all of these people gave their best because nobody does it by themselves. And you can be mayor, but you're as good as the staff you surround yourself with. And uh, it is a team effort to be sure. And I am grateful to all of them for having, having helped. Mm -hmm.